I don't think it's uncommon to have nightmares about flying and getting tangled up in wires. A wire strike accident is not the kind of accident that tends to happen to the young and inexperienced pilots. Pilots need to understand not all wires are marked and at typical flight speeds they will be almost invisible. There's a, a good chance that you'll come across some situation that will catch you off guard and you're, you will let your guard down momentarily and that's what it'll get you. Totally invisible, never saw any poles or anything whatsoever, just all of a sudden I'm looking at uh, the shoreline of the river and then the water and then just, just multiple strands of wires just, just that quick. A growing web of steel towers and electric wires is spreading across the nation. Thousands of new telecommunications antennas are going up every year. And every day, these hard-to-see obstacles pose a deadly threat to every pilot, crew, and passenger who flies below 1,000 feet. This is the wires environment. Let's talk a little bit about statistics. Over the last 10 years, we've averaged about 66 wire strikes per year. The lethality of these accidents is fairly high. And on average, it's about 30% across the board. So if you strike a tower or a wire, uh, there's a 30% chance that there's going to be a fatality involved. That changes, in fact, doubles when we go to operating uh, in or around instrument meteorological conditions or at night. If you can't see the wire uh, or the tower until the very last minute, or you may never see it, the lethality doubles to almost 60%. For the last 10 years, the, the statistics show that uh, uh, as far as for rotorcraft, uh, wire and obstruction strikes has been the number one operational cause for fatal rotorcraft accidents in the U.S. Uh, rotorcraft spend approximately 90% of their time down in that wire strike environment at low altitudes. Uh, the jobs that helicopters do, whether it's firefighting, uh, airborne law enforcement, uh, EMS, aerial applications, uh, electronic news gathering, they all spend their time at probably a thousand feet or less, so they're, they're operating nearly constantly in a wire-rich environment. At one time, the ratio of fixed wing wire strikes to rotary wing wire strikes was about four to one. A great deal more fixed wing air, uh, aircraft involved with wire and obstruction strike accidents than helicopters. That is changing substantially over the past decade or so. Three crew members and a 13-month-old patient were killed when the chopper went down in a Whether field. you are a rotary or fixed wing pilot, experienced or newly licensed, any contact with an obstruction can be fatal. Aircraft are no match for steel towers and cables. Multiple demands are placed upon a pilot's attention when operating in the low altitude wires environment. When we're flying at mosquito control, all of our flying that we do is low level, 100 feet or below. We have to be able to divide our attention between these obstacles and wires and also an agricultural GPS that we use called the wingman that tells us where to put the product down and also we will normally have an inspector sitting with us that is pointing out to the areas that he needs treated. A lot of the areas that we larvicide are right along the power lines and we're constantly having to pull up over these power lines. It's important to understand that familiarity with the hazards in a known airspace is no guarantee of safety. I did have um, a near miss um, about a year ago. There's four towers that are very close to the airport here. I see them every day when I take off. Very familiar with where they are. I had been watching these towers, but I forgot about them for a moment. And when I looked up again, I was only five seconds from being entangled in the wires. Um, it made it very difficult to sleep that night. Forty percent of the pilots who hit wires, uh, which, which is nearly half, knew the wire was there when they hit it. You can go out here and take a look at a power pole 
and look up and, and clearly see the wire and say, well, there it is. It's a visible hazard. But when you put a pilot and a crew in an aircraft 60 feet above the ground looking in a different direction or looking down on that wire, all of a sudden it becomes a very, very different entity. Visibility science becomes a huge issue there. And pilots and crews are subject to illusions. They're subject to different light uh, perspectives on the line. The key here is that the wire isn't visible all the time. It's not consistently visible to a crew in the air. I'd like to talk about the subject of how we see and avoid a hazard. Uh, in this case, we're talking about wires specifically. First of all, there has to be an image on the retina. This means that the pilot has to aim his eyes in the right direction. In other words, he has to look. He has to be looking. Then the pilot has to perceive that there is a wire there. This is based on memory and experience. He then has to project his flight path and make assumptions about whether he might be on a collision course with that wire. If he decides that it's even a remote possibility, then he has to make a decision about what kind of evasive action to take. Should he climb? Should he descend? Should he turn? Finally, he has to move the controls and then it takes a certain amount of time for the aircraft, the helicopter, or it could be an airplane, to respond. This whole process uh, can take up to five or six seconds. Depending on the lighting situation and the background, the lines may be completely invisible. They may be very obvious. It can change from moment to moment. As we look at these lines, the same set of lines, you can see areas where some of them are very obvious and easy to see, and others are invisible. And that's always the case. And so that's why it is so important to first take a look at altitude, a recon, before going down there. High recon is always recommended because the wire's environment is dynamic and constantly changing. It's essential that a pilot conduct a high-level recon before entering into that potentially dangerous environment. This is going to be an amazing time for transmission construction, and that means there's going to be more big towers and big lines in the air than we've seen in the last 50 years, more than we've ever had here in America, and there's going to be more hazard for people who are flying in those areas than we've ever seen before. So if ever there was a time to think about what's out there in the electric grid. If you're going to be in the air, this is it. So you need to really be aware of that and, and be aware that just because you've flown a particular path before doesn't mean it's safe anymore. There may be a new transmission line, big towers going in, and you've got to really be on your game. We had one of our pilots in California working on a line and he dropped a crew off on a tower structure came back that's why I meant you know came back a, a while later and they had raised the wa the static wire where he was working since then we've been real active about making sure that you know exactly what they're doing on these structures when you come back and he just barely tipped the wire it's a myth that more time in the cockpit will make you more safe experience is not a guarantee for safe flying in the wires environment so a low number of flight hours or inexperienced pilots are not uh, typically the pilots that are getting involved in these accidents. Usually these are pilots that have over 2,000 hours, are usually between 45 and 55 years old, so have been flying for several years, um, and, and just for whatever reason lose their situational awareness. So if total awareness of your environment and the amount of time spent in the pilot seat are not guarantees for your safety, what is? Training. Uh, in the hazards associated with this particular environment is, is the essential ingredient. The aviation industry has always tend to judge a pilot's competency by the thickness of his or her logbook. How many flight hours I have uh, will tend to make me a much safer pilot. Statistically, that's not true with the wire and obstruction strike accidents. In the military, especially when I went through flight school, I asked the guys to come back from flight school, how's, 
how has uh, your training changed from what I went through? Now we're talking about a couple of decades worth of training difference. And it's not really any different. Cross the wires at the poles. All roads have wires. Don't hit the wires. Uh, we might be in the wire environment. Don't hit the wires. What on earth does all that mean? I had no idea that I could, at a glance, measure uh, using the AC information, uh, I can look and visually measure how tall a tower is, compare it against what I'm looking at on the sectional or attack chart of virtually any other navigation device that I have in front of me, and confirm that's the tower, uh, that's the wire set that I'm looking at. Guy wires. Guy wires bring down doggone near as many aircraft as uh, transmission lines or static lines. And yet, very few of us understand when a power company or transmission operator has to guy off a pole. Training to avoid wire strikes is more than just a couple of hours in a classroom. It's an ongoing program. For example, the electric utility industry has adopted an industry practice of providing six months of training for its pilots and ground crews. In 2006, we had a fatal accident where we lost the crew. They ran into a 66,000 volt line. This afternoon, we got a call about a helicopter that had gone down in the canyon north of where we're standing right now. Uh, a wire electrical power line that's been downed also, we believe, is probably part of the crash. We had to reevaluate everything we do top to bottom. And we started with the patrol side. We had to figure out uh, how to make the whole thing safer to the crew. Keep the aircraft moving until you can see the skyline. Let me know when you can see the skyline. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I, I can see the conductor, but I can't see the rest of it. No? Just keep it moving until you see the skyline. Just keep moving forward. You know, I still can't see it. Uh, you know, I'm not really uh, comfortable with this here. That's all right. Just keep moving forward until you see the skyline. Don't worry about it. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to stop here. I can't see that skyline. All right. That's, the, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. Don't let somebody talk you into doing something you think is just absolutely crazy. The important thing is we realize that we weren't as safe as we thought we were. It's very important that the uh, patrolman be integrated into the flight crew. In the, in the past, he's performed almost as a mission commander in that he would say, okay, go fly this circuit, and then we'd go fly the circuit. The pilot took care of everything. He under, had to understand the fuel requirements. He had to understand uh, the terrain. He had to understand the weather, and there was none of that put on the patrolman. But now, we actually make the patrolman a part of that in the pre-planning briefing. He has to, they have to discuss the weather, they have to discuss the fuel stops, they have to discuss the lighting conditions, which way they're gonna fly it. They have to go through each one of the known hazards on that circuit so they're readily identified to the flight crew and then discuss how they're gonna mitigate these things. Before they begin the patrol, the patrolman is obligated to identify with the pilot all of the uh, hazards or uh, issues on that given circuit before it's flown. Now that, now that we've gone through this class, um, we meet with the pilot, we have a tailboard, um, we discuss about what we're going to patrol, where we're going to patrol, the weather, the winds, if we're going to be there in the afternoon. Um, also learn about some of the things in the aircraft, some of the shutoff valves for the fuel, for the batteries, um, what to do in an emergency, where the fire extinguishers are at, which I never knew before. Um, it wasn't part of the, the tailboard. It was just get in and fly. Now we're part of the cockpit as a, as a team. We both fly out there, we, we both kind of patrol, and we both come back safe every day. Um, so I, I feel more confident and more comfortable um, knowing what's going on now. Before the class, I would just be more of the hanging on and, and praying. Now I'm, I'm actually involved um, looking for hazards, um, calling out clearings or, or wherever they may be or a hazard that we're gonna be landing. And besides, you know, doing the radio, I'm, you know, part of the crew. Flying power lines is a high-risk job. Um, and so that is why that we go through such a, a long period of training, six months minimum, and the 30 hours of ride-along and all that stuff. I mean, it is a high-risk job, and all these tools that we've learned through that past six months, that's, that's what's going to keep us safe out there. The high recon, the, the proper tailboards, the experienced patrolmen, all that stuff, that's what's going to keep us safe. Uh, wire strike prevention programs should be taught at, at flight schools. 
I, I would hope that the pilots would not have to talk the management into providing the wire strike training. Uh, I like to believe that us and, and in terms of HAI and other associations and agencies have already done our job and have made companies and owner operators aware of the, uh, uh, the benefit of wire strike training and that they're already doing it. Uh, if that's not the case, unfortunately, and your company and your management are not uh, providing this type of training and don't seem to be focusing on it, then I would suggest strongly that you open up a dialogue with your management and you also might take the initiative and volunteer to your management to set up that training program and actually run and operate it. Well, a good training program should consist of a number of things. First of all, crew resource management is essential in the wire and obstruction environment. Almost all aircraft, with few exceptions, operate down low level in this environment with a crew. And so uh, a training program should involve everybody who is crew member on board that aircraft, whether that be a lineman, whether that be a flight nurse, uh, police officer, whoever. Everybody has to be speaking the same language. Another thing that I think is very important to understand is, is what the hazards actually look like down in the wire and obstruction environment. What does the enemy look like? What will hurt me if I don't know about it? And again, that isn't something that you normally learn, that we as pilots normally learn in the, in the normal aviation mainstream education. When you're looking at things like guy wires, and when you're looking at things like static wires or skylines or conductors, we don't learn about that traditionally as pilots, unless we've been fortunate enough to be mentored by somebody who really understands those hazards. So having a firm understanding of what the enemy looks like in this environment, I think, is so terribly important, because what you are ultimately going to see down there is going to be a product of what you expect to see. Expectation is, plays a major role in identifying a wire and obstruction strike accident before you get there. Chilla resident. Sheriff's investigators say the pilot was doing a maneuver to keep frost from settling on the vines when he clipped the power line. The wire environment just essentially sits and waits for you. It really doesn't make a whole lot of difference what your particular mission profile is. Now, there are some industries like power line patrol that have a greater uh, tendency because their exposure to the wire environment is, is so much greater. But the wire environment is just as deadly to a firefighter or to a military aircraft or to a crop duster as it is to a power line patrol pilot. I mean, basically, wires are in every environment that we fly in, low level. And, uh, you know, whether you're landing at a scene or, or coming in on approach or, or even flying into shock trauma. You have towers, you have wires, and, and they're basically in, in every aspect of our flying. One time we were flying a patrol on a line that we fly several times. We fly it three, four times a year, and I've flown it several times. And you had briefed all the crossings, you'd made the checks that you normally do, and someone had strung a new wire that was this kind of copper wire that was new and fresh. And it was uh, right below one of the major hilltops where we're going over this uh, area to go back down the hill and, and patrol a wire. And I was flying along, coming up a hill, and the light was from behind us, the sun, and coming up that copper blended right in with the rusty background of the trees and the fall tree. And flew right over the top of it about 100 feet, luckily. But right about the point where it was up in front of my skids, it just lit up because of the light. And you saw there's a brand new line right there below me that could have been terrible. It was just above the line I was flying, so definitely a dangerous hazard. New technologies may one day be deployed widely enough to help pilots avoid obstructions. But today, and for the foreseeable future, there is no substitute for the knowledge that experienced trainers can provide. I think some of the, the important things that are on development is the, the manufacturers making wire strike protection systems a, a standard um, piece of equipment on their aircraft. Technology is a, is a wonderful thing and we've, we've seen some real innovations just lately in wire and obstruction strike avoidance uh, come to the marketplace. But there again, it's important to remember that technology is nothing more than a fail-safe. It's certainly no substitute for training. If I could emphasize one piece of advice, it would be this. Pilots 
notoriously have the misconception that they will see wires in time when flying at wire level and you just can't count on it. If there are a couple of messages that I would leave with pilots, uh, they would be as follows. Uh, number one, when you're dealing with transmission lines, uh, you're in a corridor. And particularly for if you're in a helicopter, that corridor is moving to and fro. And you may have vegetation issues in there as well. It may be only 150 feet wide, that sort of thing. You always have to be vigilant. Pilots, uh, as with all phases of flight, have the ultimate responsibility to avoid wire strikes. And that, that includes um, a, making sure they do an extensive and complete pre-flight planning, making themselves aware of any potential wire environment or obstacles that might be in the flight path that they're planning, uh, also to see and avoid while they're actually in the air flying, and to ensure that uh, they really realize their responsibility. Uh, normally you have passengers with you or persons of property on the ground, and you have a responsibility for those lives in that property. And uh, your actions really could result in someone else's death, to be quite frank. Uh, not, not even the least of your own, of course, when you're flying. So I think pilots have to understand that they cannot acquiesce that responsibility to anyone else or assume that just because they were flying in a particular area and there was no obstacle or wire there the day before, that doesn't mean there isn't one there today. I think if there was one point that I would want to see come out of all this, if there was one thing that I could communicate, it would be the fact that wire and obstruction strike accidents are preventable. They're completely preventable if the pilots and crews take the time to understand what the enemy really looks like, understand what the hazards are down there. The important thing is, is to understand is that that isn't rocket science. It's not difficult to understand. It's just having a set of basic awarenesses. But you simply have to have those.